All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, this is Voices Communicate Community Education Series Financing Long-Term Care, Planning for Your Loved Ones and You. So we wanna start with a special thank you to our sponsors for helping make this happen. Uh, this program is free to attend because of the generosity of our sponsors and donors. So a big thank you to all who have helped make this happen. And in case you did forget to opt into our sponsor prize drawing, you can shoot your email over to events at voicestl.org to enter. We will share your information with our generous sponsors, but then once a month, we will draw a winner to receive various prizes. In June, we gave away a $25 gift card to Amazon. So lots of great stuff there. If you are interested or not sure if you submitted your name, just shoot an email over to events at voicestl.org. Here are some of our upcoming community education webinars in case you are interested or have uh, needs for more information. You can put those on your calendar and register at voicestl.org backslash education. And again, these are completely free to attend. They are all held between 12 and 1 p.m. So if you cannot attend that time, you can still register and we will send you a recording of the event afterwards. And then I would like to uh, welcome our speakers. First up we have, um, well, you can see Peter Palumbo. He is with the Palumbo Group. He is the Director of Investments. And then we also have Brian Quinn, owner and attorney at Quinn Estate and Elder Law. And Brian is also one of our voice board members. So first I'm going to hand it over to Peter and we will get started. Absolutely. Peter. Lindy, thank you very much. We appreciate the opportunity to present. And as Brian and I were talking, as we're preparing for this presentation, this is not our first rodeo. We've done this before. And Brian and I were both trained by the, by the best. And by that, I mean, we're both next generation practices. Brian works in tandem and partnership with his father. And I work in tandem with Kathy, uh, my mother for the last 15 years. So I'm going to share my screen, Lindy. Yeah. And I'm going to share the screen. Here we go. Uh, we are used to being in front of large audiences. We're used to being hybrid. We're used to coming out of COVID in this environment where, where information and education now is, is more important than ever. Uh, what Kathy and I did last summer, and it's still applicable today, is talking about the, the need to, to recognize gratitude. So as we, as we moved through the summer and moved through the, the, the worst phases of COVID, we hope, knock wood, uh, we communicated to our clients uh, and said, we've been thinking about you during this uniquely challenging time, wanted to reach out to you and be sure that you were well. Uh, what's interesting about that is that we got a lot of feedback. There was a lot of concern. There were a lot of folks that said, I have concern about uh, be it morbidity, mortality, uh, just something I don't like thinking about. Uh, is long-term care an option? And that's going to be the focus of today's presentation. I'm going to share another slide as I build out the presentation. Lindy knows which one I'm going for. Um, we called this one an important message as well. And it was interesting. It wasn't about stocks and bonds. It wasn't about risk tolerance or asset allocation. It wasn't even about timeline horizon or rebalancing. It was really about staying well while staying in. Uh, you wouldn't think that this is where we're an expert. Although Kathy's previous career was being a nurse, she would take your pulse. She would say, how do you feel? Uh, great bedside manner, and then come up with an action plan, a medical plan. Uh, now, in a very similar way, we take your pulse and say, how do you feel? Uh, what can we do to help, uh, be it long-term care or other ways of protecting? Uh, but this was a non-traditional uh, communication that we came out with, and I think it's still applicable today. It can be applicable for us, uh, for the audience that we're talking to today. It can be available to our next generation, uh, folks that are either in assisted living or considering it, folks that are homebound, uh, staying well while staying in. These are recommendations that we were making to, to folks for their health, figuring out this new order, and it's still happening for our daily lives, figuring out exactly what that means. And uh, excuse me, and uh, we, uh, you know, get through or, or persevere through COVID. 
Uh, one of the ideas was virtual travel. This is still applicable. Google Arts and Culture teamed up with over 2,500 museums and galleries. Uh, this is a piece that I'll ask Lindy to, to distribute to anyone who's interested, and you can do a virtual gallery. Uh, real connections. I mean, this is Zoom. A, a year and a half ago today, no one knew what Zoom was. They thought it was a startup company or an initial public offering. Well, right now, uh, Zoom, FaceTime, Skype, Duo, all these other places, uh, it's really about communication and these real con real connections. Um, what's less real and more about the, the qualitative side is this moment of Zen concept. Days get stressful, especially when we're making decisions about lo loved ones. Taking a quick, quiet moment to yourself open a window, take a walk, read a few passages from a book that you like. Uh, this museum moment of Zen ended up being a hashtag that we would follow, uh, be it on Instagram or one of the social media sites. Now, let's get into, uh-oh. Lenny, this might be where I tell you I need to get back to where I was. Okay. Um, yes, can you hear me? If you can see me, I am logging on right now. Can you see that? Nope. So you can. You can pull up simplifying long-term care while I'm doing this. Yep. So, Wendy, tell me if you can see my slides. Nope. Here, I will pull up your PDF. One second. We Can you see simplifying long-term care? I'd like to, but I don't right now. Mm -hmm. Brian, this is not the way we practice it. You might think I'm just trying to eat my time. Perfect, I'm back. Well, here's what's interesting. Uh, and, and Marjorie Moore just, you know, went to all panelists and said she can see it. I appreciate that because Marjorie have known each other without knowing it from Marquette University. And, and I do want to welcome Jamie to the team at Voice. And I've known Lindy for a minute, but my relationship predates these three individuals. It actually predates them because we worked with Voice when my grandmother, Kathy's mother, was exploring options, looking for an advocacy, looking for resources and a referral source. Not for long-term care, but looking for an assisted living home here in St. Louis, Missouri. So next generation isn't just what Brian and I do professionally. And we do work together with elder law attorneys and with special needs planners. Uh, but also it's, it's real. This happened to grandma. This happened to Eleanor. Uh, educational needs are important to us at the Palumbo Group and working with the Quinn firm. Uh, Education is important, whether it's me presenting to an audience at the National Guardianship Association, the Missouri Estate Trust and Elder Law Group. National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys here in Missouri, as well as nationally. This is something we do. We know that giving back is important, especially during COVID. So let's jump into the reason that we're having this presentation. Simplifying long-term care. Brian and I are kind of gonna be, you know, good guy, bad guy. Here's the way to do it if you've got a lot of time. And then Brian's gonna be the bad guy. He's gonna say, here's what you gotta do if you end up in a crisis. Um, we work well together, we work in tandem. Uh, but at the end of the day, simplifying long-term care is, is what it's about. It's about education. One of the biggest risks to your retirement or mom or dad's retirement, grandma's retirement can be long-term care. It can suck up those assets. If you or a loved one ends up needing long-term care, we'll use the acronym long-term care for LTC, that expense can be shocking. Average cost of semi-private nursing home a couple of years ago was upwards of $90,000. Uh, it can be anywhere from five to $10,000 a month, depending on where you live in the United States. Uh, but here's who's gonna use it. Someone turning 65 years old has a 70% chance. Seven out of 10 65 year olds today will need some type of long-term care services in their lifetime. Lots of strategies, and I'm not gonna go into much detail on these, but just to know that there's options, but there's also a lot of confusion out there. Uh, what you want to do is make sure that they're, you're available to understand the cost, understand the benefits, understand the insurance policy. Um, one of the ways is just to buy standalone long-term care. Another is an asset-based long-term care insurance. Uh, another that seems to make more sense right now is a hybrid product that talks about life insurance, but as a long-term care rider. Uh, back when I started 15 years ago working with Kathy, it used to be use it or lose it. 
Uh, you keep paying a premium, and then if you die without using that product or using that benefit, it just stays with the insurance company, and that wasn't a very good benefit. Um, what makes sense now is that you're, you're providing both a benefit to the legacy of that client as well as the long-term care when they need it. What I'm going to be getting into is a couple myths or a couple points about what are the, the, the myths, what are the confusion points about long-term care. Um, and I'm going to flip to that slide called misconceptions. Let's see if I can find that one too. Or Lindy, if you're flipping slides, you can pull up the one with the, the nice couple that's riding their bikes into retirement. Yep, that's what they're doing. What's interesting, if I go back to talking about Kathy and talking about Eleanor, and I'll get to the misconceptions in a moment, the way, and Brian knows this, that we start all of our presentations is literally to take a step back and talk about givers and takers. Uh, if anyone's familiar with Adam Grant, he's one of the most famous TED Talks moderators. And one of his most famous presentations is called Givers and Takers. Uh, write this down, TED Talks, Givers and Takers by Adam Grant it is well worth your 12 to 13 minutes of watching this TED Talks and understanding under your own roof, in your business, in the folks of your friend group or the folks that you've been working with, who is a giver and who is a taker. It's, it's very interesting and, and you'll, you'll see who's paired up right, who matches correctly. Uh, it's really something that we like to do as we talk about gratitude is to understand givers and takers. Uh, because at the end of the day, we're, we're caring about our loved ones. At the end of the day, we're, we're with gratitude, making sure that they're comfortable. Uh, and long-term care is one of, those, um, one of those needs as we look for the benefit. So, Wendy, I am going to flip to slide one because it looks like you have taken over, and I appreciate that. First one, uh, I already gave away the answer. We we're going to think about a quiz show per se, but the myth, I don't need long-term care. I don't want to think about it. And if I do think about it, maybe I, I won't need it. Well, we might need it. Or, or better odds than not, 70% of 65-year-olds will need it in some form in their lifetime. As these individuals are consistently living longer, uh, it's more important than ever. Uh, we had this conversation actually earlier this morning with somebody who said, you know, I've been thinking about this more with COVID. I've been thinking about this more as, as part of my friend group has been exposed. Uh, these are things that I want to shore up because I have time. If we go to the next slide, we'll be talking about uh, now that we have time to plan in my side of the presentation, uh, we'll get into the, the time if you don't have time to plan. Uh, but the next myth, uh, myth number two, my health in the first person or disability insurance will cover my long-term care expenses. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, health insurance, long-term care will not cover LTC. Uh, only long-term care insurance will cover to pay for what you cannot once that you're performing everyday activities such as bathing or dressing. Uh, we're going to go to myth number three. And this is where Brian's my expert. If I have a question that comes in on a case or a review that we're working on, we'll reach out to Brian and his father and say, you know, give us some guidance. Uh, what do elder law attorneys think about this? What's the reality? Uh, as we as we lean into NALA, National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, both in Missouri and nationally, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, will these cover my expenses? The assumption is yes, but that's not necessarily true either. Medicaid does not generally cover these costs. Pays for skilled nursing in a nursing home for a short time, probably up to 100 days, just after a hospital stay. So it's very restrictive. It's not necessarily where you want to be, where I want to be, or where I want a grandma to be. Uh, and even more so, Medicaid. Medicaid will pay for long-term care, but those individuals are very limited in, in their income and will have to spend down or have very little assets. Let's go to the next slide. I kind of like the graphic on this one. I'm not sure who did that, but I complimented the folks in marketing. Long-term care is for the elderly. That must be our, our uh, avatar for elderly with a big 60 plus. I didn't consider 60 years old being elderly uh, recently because I'm not that far off, but the need for long-term care can arise at any time. It doesn't have to be grandma's situation. It doesn't have to be your, 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 your parents or your, your, your friends as they become older. Um, it can happen you know, when they're elderly, but can also be required by younger adults. You could have an unforeseen accident or an illness occur, extensive rehabilitation, rehabilitation is required. This can quickly deplete assets and that's what will impinge upon your, your retirement. Next slide. 
long-term care misconceptions. Uh, we have two more myths. This is the last or second last of two. And then Brian, I'll be turning it over to you uh, soon thereafter. My family will take care of me if a long-term care arises. Sometimes we have this conversation during reviews and someone say, well, my favorite daughter will take care of me. Uh, she's a nurse. I paid for her to go to nursing school. She'll just stop her job, stop caring for her family and, and become my full-time aide. Well, that's a struggle. It's not just the cost of long-term care, but it's also the time uh, committed. Most individuals prefer to receive that care probably in their own homes. That's where they'd be most comfortable. Used to be it would just be for an, a, an, a facility, uh, but now it can be in home or at a facility. While family members can provide the care, they don't necessarily have those skills. If you did a great job raising your kids to be lawyers or doctors or nurses or practitioners, you know, maybe, maybe they can do that, but maybe that's not what their skill set is best needed for. Uh, this can be a huge financial burden, especially if it wasn't planned for. Average cost of income in home care, about $5,000 a month. That's for assisted living. As we pivot into skilled care or skilled nursing, that doubles to $10,000 a month on average. Again, it's very different in different zip codes. It's very different within the state, uh, very different in different states around the country. But it is important to decide how you'd like to receive that care in the future and have that conversation now and plan accordingly. Let's go to the fifth misconception. I can't afford it. What does it come down to? The old break the piggy bank um, little, little picture that we've got. Well, that tells the story. A lot of folks would rather defer this risk or defer the gratification of, you know, maybe I won't need to use it, although 70% of us will. Uh, maybe it'll be more affordable than you think. Well, the sooner the better. Taking a look at how it works, and there's not a specific pie in the sky number. There's not a $100,000 number or $500,000 number that makes sense. Uh, the average time in long-term care is about 25 months. So we make sure that we err on the side of being conservative as we look for the needs and fit the budget. It can be more affordable as stated at a younger age, so it's important to start planning. That's why there's the three different versions. And if you want to flip back to my simplifying slide, please, Lindy. The three different versions, the one that we prefer is the third, uh, life with long-term care. It's not use it or lose it. It's, it's use it or have your beneficiaries uh, be able to use it. And those are the myths as well as an overview on what long-term care planning looks like from our perspective. Thank Lindy, you, Lindy, if Peter. you pivot, I may have, thank you. Um, I'll have a few comments at the end of Brian's section as well, but I'll turn the microphone and the panelist designation over to him. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Brian, do you want me to share your slides or would, are you comfortable doing it? I, I think I'll be comfortable doing that. Let me go oh, ahead and see. Um, I just, uh, I just need some, uh, to. I guess I need you to stop uh, sharing screen here. So. I have stopped sharing. All righty, good deal. So, Never stop sharing, Wendy. Never stop sharing. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Well, Peter, thank you so much. Lindy, thank you so much uh, for, for putting this together. Um, I, uh, as, as uh, uh, everyone said here, uh, my name is Brian Quinn. I am an estate planning and elder law attorney. And uh, a lot of the concepts that Peter talked about are things that I see kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. So I can certainly say that it is always good to be able to plan ahead, especially um, I think when you start, in, whether it's your 40s or 50s or 60s or 70s, looking at a lot of the concepts that Peter talked about there and making sure that you can choose what's right for you and your family while you still have time to do that is really, really important and can dovetail so well with what an estate planning or an elder law attorney can do for you. Um, and one thing that I think uh, Peter kind of pointed out there is that there are a lot of different options out there for long-term care insurance. Well, it's not necessarily the, the old use it or lose it type of proposition, the type of uh, long-term care insurance that to me kind of um, seemed a lot like car insurance or, or homeowner's insurance in that you paid premiums every month and uh, premiums would occasionally go up every few years and you never use the insurance, it would just go away at the time of your passing. So 
Uh, one thing that, that Peter said there is you'll notice there's a life insurance component with a lot of long-term care insurance. In there. So um, somewhere you'll be able to get your premiums back if you don't use them. So there's just a lot of different options there. And I think those options have really exploded over the last 10 or 20 years. And if you haven't looked into it in a long time um, or haven't looked into it yet, I think you would find that there are a lot of different types of op options available to you. So Peter would be a great resource for that. Now on to me here. This is uh, my little feather in the cap slide here. Um, and uh, although uh, I, I, I have a, a few feathers in the cap here, probably the one that I'm most uh, um, excited about and brag the most on is the one at the very top is married to a, a wonderful woman with two awesome little kids, a four and a five year old. And uh, as of yesterday, or I guess 48 hours ago, this slide changed to two dogs as opposed to one dog. So uh, we just adopted a puppy 48 hours ago. So um, she's great at peeing on my carpet. She's uh, great at trying to take food directly <laughs> off the kitchen table. Um, but uh, she's also wonderful with my kids and, and loves to you know, snuggle in bed with you. So um, she's gonna be an awesome addition to the family. But um, I always say uh, that I am an estate planning and an elder law attorney. And I like to maybe at least go over kind of the differences between those two things when I start my, uh, my presentations here. So what estate planning really is, is it's giving someone a roadmap to administer your estate, not just when you pass away, but to, um, but to a certain extent when you have a disability, if there's anything that happens during your lifetime, you wanna make sure that the people that are in charge, your loved ones uh, usually are, have some sort of roadmap as to what your wishes are. Do you want um, a certain charity to be very uh, special and, and provide for uh, them after you've passed away? Do you wanna uh, live in a specific type of community or receive care at home? Do you, uh, how would you, what do your burial instructions look like? Um, there are a lot of different things that, that you can do with your estate planning. And most people have had some sort of interactions with estate planning attorneys in the past. Um, I always think that it's good at any age after 18 to be looking at estate planning, but certainly as you start having children or as you start looking towards retirement, those tend to be some of the big um, indicators and some of the big drivers to an estate planning attorney's office. And what we are trying to do is get what you want to who you want, when you want, how you want. So again, we want to make sure that that specific charity or your favorite son or daughter, or um, if you just got a puppy within the past 48 hours, making sure somebody can take care of them that can deal with their counter surfing um, uh, tendencies here if something were to happen to you suddenly. But just making sure that things go smoothly, usually after you've passed away, but also during a period of disability is really what an estate planning attorney is trying to do. But what you're hearing there is a lot of focus on the end. So we're kind of focusing on what happens after lifetime. How do we get things to the right people? Who's going to be in charge of what? How do we avoid ever needing to go through the court-ordered probate process? And how can we keep the court and the government kind of out of our affairs and make sure that everything passes as smoothly and tax-free as possible to our beneficiaries? So Estate planning very oftentimes is thought of as that planning for end of life, whereas elder law is a little bit more focused on the during of life component. So it's a little bit more focused on we have a long term care issue. How do we deal with that? Where do we want to live? How, what kind of assets do we have? Do, have we planned ahead? Do we need to look for government benefits? Who's going to be our caregiver? How do our tax uh, situations change? Where are mom and dad going to go? Where am I going to go? Who am I going to receive care from? There are a lot of different questions that pop up when you have those long-term care issues. And that's where elder law attorneys, especially ones that can work with a good financial advisor like the Palumbo Group and Oppenheimer, um, where can we work together to try to get, still accomplish the estate planning goals, accomplish that what you want, to who you want, when you want, how you want goals, but also make sure that we protect, preserve, and extend your assets and keep you comfortable and happy throughout the remaining years of your lifetime and receive the kind of care that you want to, that you deserve, and that you have worked hard to be able to afford throughout the course of your lifetime 
to make sure that we, we accomplish your goals. And probably most importantly, give you some peace of mind at, at the end there. Um, I always like to point out that from an elder law versus estate planning perspective, two of the big government benefits I'm going to talk about today are going to be benefits through the Departments of Ve Department of Veterans Affairs and also Medicaid, which is another program that, that Peter alluded to in his presentation. There. But I like to point out that traditional estate planning documents may not be what's best for you when it comes to protecting, preserving, and extending your assets as your situation changes over time. So as, as you grow older and as your health maybe fails, it's important to revisit your estate planning. I usually think every three to five years at a minimum. Um, I have some clients that come to me yearly to, to look at their estate plan, but certainly uh, at least getting them out of the closet dusting them off, making sure that they still do what you want, and maybe having them, if your concerns become more elder law and long-term care focused, making sure that you sit down specifically with an elder law attorney. So there are a lot of estate planning attorneys out there, not all of them, in fact, I would say not many of them, actually are, are proficient and competent in the area of elder law. So having an elder law attorney review those documents is always important. So as an elder law attorney, um, I uh, sometimes will be protecting your assets, usually using specialized types of trust, maybe different ones than were suggested to you when you were uh, earlier in life, uh, of still avoiding the probate process, honoring healthcare um, decisions, maintaining your quality of life and care, creating a legacy for your family. And I know I'm reading off the bullet points here, but I wanted to stop at the very last one I always said, I already said it, giving you peace of mind is really the ultimate goal here. It's what gets me up in the morning. It's what allows me to look at myself in the mirror every day, and know that I'm doing good work for people is because a lot of people will come into my office with a problem and they'll leave with that, that burden lightened a little bit. They'll be walking a little bit differently on the way out. And I'm happy to report that uh, a lot of my clients, instead of like some other areas of law where they tend to, uh, to curse their attorney when it's all said and done. We occasionally get some cookies and brownies and even a hug or two in the office here and there. So um, that, that giving you peace of mind is ultimately what an estate planning and elder law attorney is trying to do. So a lot of the times we see people again when uh, there's a long-term care crisis, which sort of begs the question, and again, Peter did allude to this as well in his presentation, but what is long-term care? Well, we talk a lot about activities of daily living when it comes to long-term care. And I sometimes like to tell people what my morning looked like in, in that uh, case. Um, so I, when I woke up this morning, the first thing I did was I got out of bed. That's called transfer. When you can get in and out of a bed or a chair or, or a car even, that's transferring uh, yourself. And I've got my feet on the floor there. I have a, a puppy, like I said, at, as of the last 48 hours, and um, puppies need to get out immediately when they wake up. So what I did was I practiced continence. I also needed to use the restroom, but I knew that that puppy was going to be on my carpet if I didn't get him out. So uh, I, I got my dogs out, and then after that, I used the, the, the restroom, so I toileted it. So right there, I've transferred, practiced continence, I've, I, I've uh, done toileting. After that, I bathed, got myself dressed for the day, and then I ate some breakfast. That's bathing, dressing, and eating. So those are your traditional six activities of daily living. And when you have an issue with two out of those six, you meet the clinical definition of long-term care. Or if you have some sort of cognitive impairment, like Alzheimer's or dementia, something where you're having trouble rem remembering to or remembering how to do these things, then you're going to meet the definition of long-term care as well. <clears throat> How you pay for long-term care is uh, Medicare. I've got here up to 100 days of rehabilitation. What that doesn't tell you is that you don't always get 100 days of rehabilitation. And it's, it's only after you've spent um, three, three uh, nights in a hospital as an actual admitted patient to the hospital, so not on observation staff. You go there, let's say you fall, you slip, you fall, you, you break a bone or there's some injury, you're in the hospital and they discharge you to skilled nursing. 
for rehabilitation. Medicare, if you are a recipient of Medicare, can pick up um, some of that time. But usually they cut that off well before 100 days because they see that you've uh, reached a level where you're not getting any better and they don't feel like there's a need to continue to pay for it there. So at that point, you usually switch to some form of private pay. So you may be looking at uh, things like IRAs or 401ks or investment accounts. If you've met with someone like Peter Palumbo uh, from the Palumbo Group at Oppenheimer, maybe you have different financial solutions in place that can pay for care. And then after that, a lot of people look at government benefits. So VA benefits and Medicaid, maybe even supplementing some of the other uh, private assets that they have or, or long-term care insurance that they have in place. So in order to qualify for different government programs that are gonna pay for long-term care, you have to have your assets aligned in the right way. And so this is kind of a general slide as to how the government, not specific to any, uh, any particular program, but sort of generally how they look at your estate. So on the left-hand side, you see exempt assets, which I've got as your principal residence subject to, depending on the program, equity or lot size limitations. You've got a car, uh, personal contents of so things like rings, watches, jewelry, your socks, your shirts, your shoes, all of those things. Term life insurance with no cash value. Irrevocable prepaid funeral policies oftentimes are going to be considered an exempt asset. And depending on the program, sometimes there's business assets, income producing business property, or even cash value of life insurance that doesn't count against you. On the far right hand side, I've got a couple unavailable assets, things like Medicaid compliant annuities, promissory notes, irrevocable trusts, gifts to family and friends and charities. Those are things that you've relinquished some control over, so they're no longer considered a countable asset, even though depending on, on the way that you convert assets to being unavailable may run afoul of some of the, the program guidelines for some of these government benefits. Then right in the middle there is really uh, the, the countable assets, which is really what we're concerned about depending on the government program. So that's checking, saving CDs, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, IRAs, annuities, um, real estate that's not considered your personal residence, bonds, things like that, that are going to be things that you could convert to cash and use to pay for your care. Um, a lot of the times, depending on the government program, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to assess what people have in each category when they come into my office, in addition to what benefits are available and fit their needs the best. And then I'm trying to, if we have too much in one column, strategically shift them to one of the other columns so that we're able to meet some of the program guidelines for whatever program they're, they're looking at. Gifts are really kind of tricky at times because although you have this IRS exclusion, your annual per doni exclusion where you can give money away, and although you have these estate tax exemptions where you can shield money from taxes after you pass away, gifts can run afoul even if you're giving something the IRS doesn't care about. Gifts, whether it's to individuals, trusts, or charities, need to be done in a way where they are intentionally done with professional advice and with a plan. Because each one of these programs, maybe not each one of them, but at least the two that we'll talk about today, the VA's aid and attendance program and, and the Medicaid programs have what are called look back periods. And what they do is they look backwards to see what you've done to try to divest assets that would otherwise be in that countable asset column. And have you given them away in some way where it run, runs afoul of their, their program? So again, seeing someone, if you have an elder law concern well, well in advance to discuss gifting and things like that so you don't run afoul of some of these programs is really, really important. The state recovery is another thing to think about. Just going back uh, really quickly here to slides, remember that top left um, exempt asset, your principal residence. Well, there is under the Medicaid program, the ability for a state recovery. So even though you may say, hey, I've got this house, it's worth you know, two, $200,000, $300,000, $400,000. Um, I know Medicaid's not gonna look at that as an asset and I can get all my other assets under their net worth limitation. 
A lot of people don't realize that Medicaid starts accruing a lien that they can place against the resident, and they will place that lien up to the value of the benefits that they provide over the course of someone's lifetime. So oftentimes what happens is somebody, uh, someone's beneficiaries, uh, they may have been paying the mortgage payment or paying the utilities or cutting the grass with the idea that they were eventually going to inherit the house. They get a nice, nasty little letter from Medicaid at the very end saying, hey, we're going to go ahead and assert a lien on this property. And if you sell it at some point in the future, we are going to take this much of the equity. there." So always keeping in mind, even though some uh, exempt assets may not count against you, we have to think about what's going to happen down the road and maybe even after your lifetime with those assets as well. Again, depending on the program that you go with. Hmm. So let's talk a little bit about VA benefits. The VA is a huge animal. <clears throat> they administer all kinds of different programs out there. The, they, uh, there are home loan programs, there are education programs, there are programs for surviving spouses of injured or di uh, disabled uh, veterans. They're, I think they run the largest healthcare system in the, in the United States as well through the VA hospital and clinic system. But they also administer two programs that one that I'll touch on and one that I'll dive a little bit more deeply into, the VA Service Connected Disability and then the VA's Pension with Aid and Attendance Benefit. Service Connected Disability is basically the VA's workers' compensation program. You were injured during your time of the service, they rate you on the scale of 0% to 100% disabled, and they pay you based on that disability uh, rating. So you're on active duty, you were injured, doesn't matter whether you were shot or you slid into home plate during a softball game the wrong way. As long as you were on active duty and you're still injured during uh, uh, today, they will uh, pay you based on the percentage rating of disability that you have. Now, most people that I see come to me for the VA's pension with aid and attendance benefit. That is the VA's long-term care benefit, at least in my mind available to not only veterans, but also the surviving spouses of veterans as well. Provides a tax-free income deposited directly into their checking account that based on their situation, they'll pay different rates. Married veteran, right around uh, $2,300 per month. Single veteran, a little over $1,900 per month. And the surviving spouse can still receive a maximum of $1,244 per month. The VA does not pay that directly to providers. Like I said, it is deposited directly into their checking account. And although the idea is that they will use that to defray some of the costs of care, can really be used for just about any, um, any, anything whatsoever, as long as the veteran or spouse themselves are uh, considered competent to do so. So how do you qualify for this benefit? Um, for most any uh, veterans that I see, your general service requirements are that you have to have served at least 90 days consecutively in active duty, one day of which was during a period of war, and you receive something other than a dishonorable discharge. Um, if you have a veteran that meets all those criteria, and notice that I didn't say you had to have served in a theater of conflict. You don't have to have served during a, in, in a war zone. It only matters when you served, not where you served. Now, if you meet those tests, um, or if it, as a surviving spouse you meet those tests, they're going to see if you meet that clinical definition of long-term care. You need assistance with two activities of daily living. They're going to look at your income versus your medical expenses, and they're going to see whether you're pretty close or even deficit spending when it comes to your income versus medical expenses and they're gonna figure how much of that maximum amount of VA benefit they pay you based on what your income situation looks like. As long as your countable assets are under right around $130,000. I've got $130,773 here to be exact. Couple things um, just uh, related to this benefit is a residence is going to be exempt as long as it's on two acres or less of real estate. There are ways where I have actually had a situation recently where I argued to the VA and was able to obtain some evidence that without the first two acres, the remaining size of the lot would be totally valueless. 
And the VA did expand in that situation. They said, well, not only is that two acre lot, but also the remaining 25 acres that this property sits on is going to be considered exempt. So there are some ways around this. I don't like the fact that they chose instead of an equity value of the home, they chose a lot size here, but that's what we have to work with with the VA. So um, there is a three year look back period. So they will look to see how you have and what you have transferred as far as assets in the last five years. And for every about $2,300 that you transfer out of your state in a manner where it's intended to obtain VA eligibility, they'll, uh, they'll penalize you for one month. That maximum penalty can be up to five years. So again, don't apply for this benefit without some professional advice. You have to be accredited like I am and many other attorneys are to present and prosecute claims. No one can charge to co complete the VA form. Um, sometimes the estate planning advice that goes into that VA application can be charged for, but not by the time you actually get to filing the forms. Benefits are retroactive to the first day of the month, the month after you apply. So today is July 13th. If you apply for VA benefits today, August 1st is your retroactive date. As crazy as this sounds, the VA takes a while to adjudicate applications. So sometimes that retroactive date can be really, really important, especially if your claim is pending before the VA for somewhere between five to 10 months at time. Um, benefits do receive the cost of living adjustments in December and big one here, all payments are completely tax-free from the VA here. So it's something that you don't have to report on your taxes and you use every dime of what comes in from the VA to pay and help defray your costs of care. Um, Medicaid. Another big program, this is a, unlike the VA, which is a, a federal program, the Missouri uh, Medicaid program, which as of August of 2007 is called MoHealthNet, it's actually a joint state and federal program. So the state funds some of it and the federal government funds some of it. States each have the ability to make their own rules to a certain extent. So they're under certain federal guidelines because they receive federal funding for this program. In Missouri, we, there is a caseworker's guide called the Income Maintenance Manual. That's kind of your caseworker's um, Bible, if you will. And Mo Health Net, Medicaid, like I said, in Missouri, called Mo Health Net, administers a whole lot of programs out there. There's the vendor or nursing home payments program. There's home and community-based uh, programs. There's um, Mo Health Net for the age blind and disabled, which is more of a medical assistance program. There's the Sarah Lopez waiver and many other programs as well. The one that we're going to focus on today is the vendor program. So vendor benefits basically provide payments directly to a nursing home. So if you qualify for this, usually what happens is Medicaid says, we want you to pay a portion of your income uh, to the, the nursing home. That's your copay or what Medicaid calls your surplus amount. I think it's easier to refer to it as a copay there. So you pay your copay to the nursing home, we'll pick up the rest. You have to be a resident in need of skilled nursing level care. You're in Missouri, you have to be a, medic, uh, a Missouri resident. You have to be uh, in a Mo Health Net licensed bed, which depending where you are geographically can sometimes be the hardest part of the Medicaid application, actually finding a bed that um, you are eligible to receive those Mo Health Net benefits, uh, being in that bed prior to making a, a Medicaid application. Exempt assets, very similar to that slide that I had. Here we have a personal residence actually with an equity value of up to $603,000. Your motor vehicle, personal belongings, your uh, burial lot, an irrevocable prepaid funeral policy, or up to $1,500 worth of cash value, and certain income producing property, such as an income producing farm, can be considered exempt as well. There is a five-year look-back period for Medicaid benefits. So we talked about that three-year look-back period for VA, different look-back period for Medicaid, which again sort of highlights how there are different nuances for every program that you look at here. The penalty divisor for VA benefits, every, for every about $2,300 that you transferred out of your estate within that three years leading up to an application, there was a one-month penalty. With Medicaid, for every about $6,600 that you transfer out of your estate uh, leading up to, in the five years leading up to a Medicaid application, there's a one-month penalty. 
Unlike the VA, which has a maximum penalty period, there is no limit on how long Medicaid can penalize you. So again, do not make gifts and make a Medicaid application with some without some professional advice. Now, there's a lot of different ways to spend down your assets. You can uh, purchase exempt assets. You can improve exempt assets. Maybe you want a new kitchen at your house or you want to purchase some new stuff or a new car. Um, you can pay off debt. You can prepay for your funeral. You can pay for service, which I always tell people, selfishly speaking, could include attorney's fees. Um, but it can also include paying somebody to cut your grass or um, hiring someone to uh, install things in your house. You can also convert certain assets into, dip, into certain types of income streams, if that makes sense as well. Usually that's going to be Medicaid compliant annuities and promissory notes. And there are some other um, tools, tricks and tools of the trade, but these are some of the, the big ones here. Don't forget there are state recovery issues with Medicaid and there are different rules in place for married couples compared to single individuals. So much, much different there than there is uh, compared to the VA benefits program. There is through Medicaid what's called a division of assets process where we actually allocate a large amount of the couple's estate to the spouse that's in the community, the one that doesn't need nursing home benefits. And then we have the, the institutionalized spouse or the spouse that's in the nursing home spend down to certain levels on their side of the ledger as well. So with Medicaid, this is just a comparison chart here for those uh, couple programs here. With Medicaid, you're going to see it primarily in skilled nursing, um, uh, skilled nursing homes. That's where you're going to see that vendor program. There's also home care benefits and, uh, and several other programs out there as well. Your look back period for Medicaid is five years. Your asset level as a single individual that you need to be down to is $5,035. Up until July, uh, July 1st, it was $5,000 flat. They gave us that big increase of $35 here 12 days ago or 13 days ago, I guess. There's also a state recovery uh, with Medicaid as well. Now, comparing that with Veterans Aid and Attendance, which is a little bit more limited in what they pay because they don't pick up the difference of what you see in a long-term care um, community. But what you see is different levels of care that they're willing to pay for, home care, adult day services, independent and assisted living, and also individuals that are in skilled nursing as well. Your look back period is different and your asset level is drastically different, at least for a single individual, than it is with Medicaid. So a three-year look back period for VA benefits and $130,000 plus for their asset level. There's also no estate recovery right now for VA benefits. Could that change in the future? Absolutely. But uh, as of right now, it's a little bit more favorable from an estate recovery standpoint. So that actually ends my portion of the presentation. So I'm gonna stop uh, sharing my screen here. And um, I think we probably built in a little bit of time for questions. So uh, Lindy, why don't I go ahead and turn this back over to you and um, you can uh, see if there's any questions for us. Then. Absolutely. Uh, thank you both Peter and Brian for sharing with us today. Um, if you do have any questions, I know uh, some of this stuff was uh, you know, quickly presented. Some of it was in greater detail, but we will be sharing the, um, the slides and the documents. Um, so if you have a question, please drop it in the Q&A. I see some participants have raised their hands, but um, we ask that you drop your uh, questions in the Q&A or the chat, whichever works for you. Um, please do that. Um, so we'll give it a few minutes. For a few seconds for people to drop their questions in. Mm -hmm. And this is being recorded. So if you missed anything or um, you know you have uh, didn't quite write down the note or something, uh, I will be sharing the recording later on this week. And okay, this is from Yolanda. The estate recovery is a family member able to remain in the home. Some families are afraid to apply for Medicaid for this reason. Yeah, so there are actually a couple exceptions to estate recovery that I didn't really have time to, to go through. 
let's say that you um, you have a family that uh, has one spouse that's going into a nursing home and another spouse that's living at the house. Medicaid actually cannot place a lien against the house at, at, while you have a spouse that's living there or a minor or disabled child that's living at the house. So there are some times where um, individuals uh, can file and still defeat a state recovery just based on their living situation. And there'll also be some times where um, someone will move into a nursing home and will actually recommend selling the house knowing full well that there will be some additional assets that will come into the estate, but also knowing that we'll be able to devise a plan to um, either transfer those to, um, there, there are certain transfers that, whether they're to a spouse or a disabled child and things like that, where we may be able to get around needing to spend down all of the assets in the estate. Um, so it's, it's really one of those things where I know I'm gonna give you a good lawyer answer here and say it depends. But there are some exceptions to that rule. And I would always say just see someone like myself um, prior to making that decision. And don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be afraid to, to file because you might have a situation in place where you, you don't have to worry about state recovery, even despite that kind of general rule there. Thank you, Brian. You're welcome. Um, any other questions? Uh, someone else had raised their hand, but they haven't put their question into the chat. Oh, uh, this comes from Teresa. Can a long-term care annuity be used for home health care? Peter, would you like to take that or you want me to jump in? Oh, Peter, I don't think that you uh, are dialed in. I can probably. Brian, I'll let you address there you that. There you I, go. Sure, absolutely. It kind of depends on the type of annuity. So again, a great lawyer mm -hmm. answer that I'm starting with there. But um, certain annuities will have um, specific riders where you will have um, a big long-term care bucket associated with them. So sometimes it's even more uh, than what the initial payment to purchase the, the annuity was. They'll have a little bit bigger bucket that can be used for long-term care. Um, some long-term care policies will specifically state that it can only be used for this level of care. Other ones will have home health care, um, assisted living and nursing home uh, levels where you can use them for that. Um, other annuities may just be purchased simply to provide income. And so it's almost like purchasing a short-term pension there. Um, and certainly any income that you receive can be used for long-term care. So I think it it again depends on the type of annuity and the options that there are, but there are annuities that can be utilized for long-term care purposes in and in-home care uh, as well. Right. We agree from our perspective as, as fiduciaries. Uh, what makes sense at the same time is to slow down, realize that emotions will impact these decisions, uh, realize that having a trusted advisor like Brian like the Quinn group, like making sure that you find someone who's accredited that can help lead you to the right direction. Uh, so carefully crafted strategies help. And, and you know, in closing, we do appreciate uh, those families allowing our family to help protect theirs. Thank you. The and other um, question, Lindy, sorry, to, I'm kind yeah. of moving your thunder there. Go, go ahead. So. No, go right ahead. It is, it is a long question. So uh, I'll let you go ahead and answer that one. So Lauren McCall, uh, excuse me, hey, um, uh, we, we have a question here that says that we, um, they, they know of someone who has uh, a family member that um, is in assisted living right now, um, and that family, uh, that, that, that individual's assets are being used to pay for um, care in the assisted living community. And then the question is, is that gonna be held against this, this individual, uh, what they've paid to the assisted living community? Is it gonna be held against them when it goes to apply for Medicaid? I think there's two answers to that question. First of all, any kind of natural spend down of your assets, whether it's in-home care or independent living or assisted living, or even if you just go to the boats and bet everything on black, any sort of natural spend down is not going to be counted against you. It's, it's when you're making gifts to family members and charities is another one to, to watch out for that a lot of people don't know about. The gifts to family members and gifts to charities and gifts to certain types of trusts 
can impact someone from a standpoint of uh, long-term care. Now, there are also these deposits that you will sometimes see with assisted living communities as well. And sometimes those deposits um, with a continuing care retirement community, depending on what is available to the senior, if they move out, can be counted again, as an asset against you. But just any kind of natural spend down is not going to be counted against you. Thank you so much, uh, Brian and Peter, for sharing with us today. Um, I think that's about all the time we have and all the questions we received. So thank you so much. Um, just a mention to all of our attendees, um, as you press uh, the button to leave, there is a survey that will pop up. We would appreciate your feedback um, to you know, help us improve and continue our education offerings. Um, again, I will send out a recording and the slides and documents that each of them had presented today. So if you do have any questions, I believe both of them have put their contact information uh, in those uh, slides. So uh, feel free to reach out to them. So thank you again for joining us and we hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you everyone.